Welcome to Sports Performance Radio, Episode 10. I am your host, B. Chavez, and as always, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining me here again this month. Um, today, I am bringing you what I believe to be my very best and certainly my very most favorite show to date. I also must confess that this is, without a doubt, the most difficult introduction I've ever done. I will try to explain. This month's guest is a man that is a physical culture buff, a bodybuilding buff turned historian turned author. Uh, his name if, is Randy Roach. Uh, I certainly hope that you immediately know who that is, but unfortunately I'm going to guess many of you don't, and that is a terrible shame. Um, Randy Roach is the author of uh, a number of things, but uh, most relevant to this, a series of books entitled Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors. Volume 1 was uh, very possibly my most favorite uh, publication on the subject of strength training ever. It really begins when physical culture begins, literally the prehistory through the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, really the birth of the vaudevillian strength era, uh, turned strongman, turned by the beginnings of organized bodybuilding. It's really just a fascinating and, and wonderful whirlwind tour through the prehistory of bodybuilding. Uh, volume two. Oh, by the way, let me, let me digress and say that also in its original format, the book itself is just, just a handsome, handsome piece of, of work. It's just, uh, it, it's a large, black, thick, uh, gloss cover. Uh, it's just really, in my mind, everything that a book, particularly a, 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 a tome of history such as it is, uh, it's everything that it should be. It's just a really wonderful thing to have on a bookshelf and reflect on, uh, read. You know, I, I tend to, books like that, I tend to read, you know, kind of once a year. I just break them out and reread them. Never do I tire of the history of what I do and, and, and the, the industry I've chose to be part of. So it's, it's just, to me, it's really just a, an amazing thing to have. Uh, then, then Randy published volume two, which, uh, began, you know, mid 20th century up to kind of the, um, uh, the Frank Zane era, the post, post Arnold's, uh, retirement m pumping iron, uh, and lets off just before the quote, Big comeback, the Australia, uh, what many call a debacle. I, I tend not to see it that way. But nonetheless, Volume 2 is an excellent, excellent book. And quite honestly, I think to some degree it's something that Randy didn't intend it to be. Uh, but I really appreciate it, both because I really appreciate Honest History and because uh, I personally am a big fan of Arthur Jones and the Nautilus Machine Empire. Uh, I really believe that Volume 2 of Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors is, without a doubt, the most honest and definitive historical account of the Jones impact, influence, and effect on organized bodybuilding and strength training and uh, even athletics at large. I really think that that was probably not Randy's intention, but I really believe that he did a, a almost a better job chronicling Jones' involvement in things than the actual history of bodybuilding. And and believe me, Jones was deeply entwined in that. So it's really, to me, really a fascinating and kind of a cross-platform uh, volume. Really, really enjoyed it. And then most recently, of course, you know, volume one, volume two. Now we have volume three, book one. Volume three is so massive uh, that it's been been broken into three different installments. The first installment is now on the market, um, and it covers almost as exclusively the big Arnold comeback of 1980, and it is, a, again, without a doubt, the most comprehensive historical account of those events. It's really, if you have even the remote interest in bodybuilding uh, as a organized sport and in any way have an interest in, you know, the, the, the life and times of Arnold and the competitive career thereof. Um, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to own this. It's a fascinating story. So that's, that's the quick background. The guest is Randy Roach. 
And this is the body of work which he's done is, is to date three volumes of Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors that chronicles the history of essentially, we'll use just the short phrasing of bodybuilding. Um, really, he talks about how it went from kind of vaudeville acts to physical culture to, you know, to, to pageantry to bodybuilding to, so it's really, you have to read his books to really even understand the language. But, for the context of this, we'll say the history of bodybuilding. Um, Randy chronicles the history of bodybuilding. And that in itself is, is fascinating and, and wonderful and, and would always make him just a, a perfect guest for this, uh, forum. The part that makes this introduction difficult is, uh, I don't know how much I'm really should or even legally allowed to say. I don't really understand the, the workings of, lawsuits and all of that sort of thing, fortunately. Um, but the short answer is, in very modern times, very recent times, um, the bodybuilding has essentially been held at a stranglehold by the NPC and IFBB. And for those of you that do not know, this much at least is public knowledge, they have gotten themselves into some very significant legal problems. Um, they are being looked at by essentially every agency with a few letters after their name. They're, they're being looked at by the, the FBI, the IRS, the, the, the list goes on and on. Every, literally, probably the DEA. Everybody who has some initials is now investigating the activities of the NBC and IFBB. And, uh, without question, um, there's going to be heavy repercussions. Uh, I won't say to who or for who, because quite literally I do not know, but I know that it is deep to the roots, it's pervasive, and it's very, very serious. And, of course, being a historian, a lot of the material Randy has published has come into slightly different light, in light of these litigations, allegations, investigations, and so what really Randy put out as just wonderful historical material is now just a really, really nuclear hot, uh, problematic body of work for an enormous portion of the industry. There are uh, just a, a, an uncounted number that are, if not blatantly afraid, they're concerned, offended, um, jeopardized by the things Randy has written, and he did not in any way write them in an accusatory fashion. He wrote them in a historical fashion. And because of that, the sales of his book has suffered. Certainly the advertising platform for him has suffered. People don't want to have him on a show, on their shows. They don't want to even admit that these bodies of work exist. Um, and it's really an incredible example of all the things that the NPC and IFBB have done wrong to get themselves in this level of trouble. Um, when they come up against a, 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 an impediment of some kind, they use their force and influence to bury that impediment. And that's exactly what they're doing here. They're showing their very culpability by, quote, blackballing a, a, such an honest and legitimate historian as Randy Roach. And I find it absolutely shameful. I don't know that it's done in this organized fashion, like a decree came down from the highest mountain of the NPC and said, thou shalt not talk to Randy Roach, for he has offended us. But the reality is the NPC has such a stranglehold on everything, every single minion down the ladder is desperately afraid of offending the person immediately above them. And because of that, you get this cascading conspiracy that leads to the diminishment of such just wonderful work as this series of books, Muscle, Smoke, and Mirrors. And so I just, I really don't typically make my introductions this vast or this, certainly not this vast without the uh, involvement of the guest. Uh, but in this case, I just really feel it important that you understand the context of what this man has done, the importance, and, and to some degree, the magnitude of what this man has done. The coming volumes could really radically be affected literally by the preceding volumes. You know, the next volumes could include things like, and then the entire management of the NPC went to jail, or literally the government put a padlock on a door and closed said organization. 
I, the, 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 the coming responses to things that have been set in motion, and I might, I might add, not in any way by Randy Roach. He simply has been chronicling it, which to some degree has made him seemingly more, more offensive than the people that actually set these actions in motion, which I find really baffling and confusing. But nonetheless, a quick summary. Randy has written fabulous books. The climate is such that everyone is scared to death of the truth and history and true journalism, and it has made this man um, no friends and certainly no not nearly as much money as he should. And uh, I hate to mention the word money, but everyone goes to work for money. You may or may not love your job. You may or may not love what you do. Uh, you may or may not be proud of what you do, but everyone goes to work for money. That's the point. If you're not going to work for money, then you're not going to work. You're just performing an activity. Uh, I think that's pretty obvious. So this man has spent an awful lot of time and effort to work on this body of work, and he's not being properly compensated because of small-minded, fear-mongering folks in power afraid to lose their power. And that is wrong. And I just feel deeply compelled to bring that to your attention and put that in your mind so that when you hear this man speak, there's some context behind it and some context for the future, which really is the whole point of history. The point of history is to, okay, you, yeah, it's nice to know the history, know some numbers and statistics and who won what when, but the reality is it gives you an overview of the direction of things to come, hopefully, theoretically. That whole, you know, he who does not know history is bound to repeat it. That sort of thing is true. If you know history, you can have a reasonable concept of what's coming. And ironically, that's kind of what I'm getting at. If you read Randy's work, you can see a horrible train wreck coming. And uh, I think we're there. I think that 2016, 2017 is going to be quite the reckoning for organized bodybuilding. And it will be very interesting to see. And I just hope that people can wake up to the value of history and uh, wake up to the value of this body of work that Randy has produced. And uh, I really sincerely hope that in the concept of good economy, the concept of supporting one's own local economy, the concept of doing what's best for your sport. Um, people will read these books, buy these books, disseminate them to their friends, um, that sort of thing, both to financially compensate Randy and both to elevate the collective knowledge of all parties involved. So there's a little background. There's a little concept of what's to come. The interview that's about to come with Randy Roach is uh, about 90 minutes, about 80, 85 minutes long, and it covers essentially everything in context of uh, organized bodybuilding, weightlifting, and it's more morphage into powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting, strongman, uh, just kind of that, that whole chain of events that led us to the landscape of the very segregated bodybuilding powerlifting, weightlifting, strongmen that we have today, and how, as you move further back in time, they become more and more unified. Uh, so it's, it's really, that in itself is just a very fascinating uh, bit of thought and train of thought. And one last thing I'd like to point out um, that, that really fascinates me personally is um, Randy, and I, I don't think he advertises this, and I, I hope he doesn't become offended for me, me bringing it to your attention, but Randy is blind. Randy is legally blind. Now, uh, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but the man writes for a living. The man is a historian. The man gives us a 90-minute interview on the concept of, of you know strength training in, in history, and he does so without the power of vision. There's no written word. He has no notes. He has nothing in front of him. Th this man has such a, 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 a handle, such a grasp, such a body of knowledge that this is simply what was on the top of his head. This isn't you know a pre-prepared notes and syllabus and as as I would do if I was giving this talk. This is just him casually discussing material that he knows inside and out. So just also bear that in mind to give you an idea of just the magnitude and the width and birth of what this man has at the tip of his tongue, at the top of his head. Um, it's just fascinating. So that is going to be sufficient for the intro introduction. Uh, the next thing you're going to hear is uh, me on the phone 
with Mr. Randy Roach. Don't forget to sign up for the SPR and Evil Genius Sports Performance Newsletter via the Team Evil GSP website. Evil Genius Sports Performance is now accepting a limited number of new clients. If you would like a consult, please email via the Team Evil GSP website. All right, folks, as promised, we are live on the phone with author extraordinaire, historian, and really so many other things, Mr. Randy Roach. Randy, how are you, buddy? Very good today, Broderick. Very good. I Again, just briefly, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, you are exactly the kind of person I want to bring to the public's attention, and uh, this is exactly the kind of material that I want to just basically inundate people with and make them think about the past uh, to maybe see the future in a different light. So, by by all means... Where would you like to begin, and what would you like to say, sir? Well, this came about with our own discussion. Like you're into powerlifting, and I would—I've always been interested in all the disciplines, even though I might not have been very good at a number of them. But you always—I found that interviewing for Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, doing that project, which has been ongoing for 13 years, I've spoken to a lot of people, a lot of hardcore guys, and. I, I became interested in the relationship between the disciplines such as powerlifting, weightlifting, bodybuilding, and strongman, and the hybrids, uh, the guys who, you know, today with uh, genetics, a lot of the guys are basically been sifted out. Like, you can really tell the bodybuilder from the powerlifter, from the weightlifter, from the strongman. Even though a lot of the powerlifters are strongman, there's a lot of cr- crossover there. But this relationship, it goes back... Um, I'm not going to go back, you way back in the days of Greek and stuff. I will go back like even just like 120, 125 years ago when the word physical culture was starting to become more prominent and gym, gym, gymnastics was once again becoming more popular, exercise was becoming popular, and the barbell and resistance training was I would even getting, put wrestling in that, in that category yep. as well. George Hackenschmidt comes to mind immediately, right? There's a lot of these guys wrestled and they, they, they were all around strength athletes and they, they did, again, there wasn't anything, there was no formal weightlifting federations back in say late 1800s. They, they were what were called professional strong man acts. And many of them were just big burly guys who could hoist a lot on their backs and, and lift platforms with people, you know, hold horses back. Many countries had uh, their different lifters. Um, Apollon, Louis uh, Uni from uh, France, he was uh, operated under the name Apollon. He was a strong guy, big guy, um, you know, like 6'3", 260, 290. And, and Again, many of their lifts. If I could interrupt you there, interesting little historical note. Uh, an awful lot of our lif- uh, listeners are strong men, professional and amateur, and you'll find that the axle used in competitive strongman events is technically referred to as a pollen's axle, and that is in fact for the named after the namesake of that very person. He, a pollen, was very famous for lifting an axle with train wheels on it. Yeah, it's called pollen's the pollen wheels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, is there some dispute over the um, two-inch diameter? What's the width used today? I, I believe it's two and a quarter. I believe it's the same diameter as the end of an Olympic bar. Yeah, I think his his axle is supposed to be. There's controversy behind that story. I, I, again, with many of the old stories, there's always going to be controversies with Paul Anderson and stuff like that. What's the weight of the axle they're lifting today in the strongman? <clears throat> um, it, it actually it varies widely. Um, you know, we have some, you know, with the world's strongest man, the weights are one, and then at the Arnold, the weights are actually quite a bit larger. But we have uh, we have guys doing axle presses now with uh, 400 pounds. Okay, so they're they're pressing it; they're not cleaning the weight because that's where controversy came well, in. Well, they're doing a, what's called a continental clean, which is its own uh, little conspiracy in strength. Yeah. In strength, rather than like an Olympic when, barbell style clean with bars picked from the floor to the shoulders, they're kind of popping it on the belly and then kind of yeah. weakling yeah. under it and yeah, it, you know, to me, it never really mattered, man. If you get the, no matter, if you're just wrestling that bar, I don't really give a shit how you get the bar up. You know, that's how you get the bar up. Like, I mean, uh-huh. if you do it one swoop and you take it to your waist and kind of clean it to the to to me, chest, to me, to me, it wouldn't matter to me. I agree. To me, that's the wonderful 
uh, purpose or, or reason for the different disciplines. If you want to see full competitive cleans, you watch Olympic weightlifting. If you want to yeah. see a giant mammoth of a man wrestle something into position and throw it over his head, you're going to watch Strongman. Or yeah, like we're me, talking about the days, yeah, be, yeah, <laughs> before uh, before the the three lifts were uh, were basically accepted with the when the Olympics came. In 1896, weightlifting was was part of the first sport, but it wasn't in every one. I think the 1920 AAU took over American weightlifting and they established the clean and jerk the press. But before that, there was all sorts of lifts: one arm swings, one arm dumbbell press, bent presses. They were using hoist and semi deadlifts. Uh, you know, putting the hands on their thighs and seeing how many guys they can lift on the platform. Like Paul Holland was one. Louis Sear was in Canada. You know, uh, later, um, you know, Eugene Sandow. He wasn't a, uh, he was a strong man act, but again, Sandow had the physique. Even, uh, I believe it was a Paul and had a, in his younger days when he was still lean, leaner, he had no one to have a good physique. Herman Gorner from Germany. They, these guys were all over the world performing in circus acts and beer halls and in, in the United States it was vaudeville. That's where, um, Sandow made his mark. Was though coming over here to America and with Florence Ziegfeld and performing his act, but he was uh, he he was doing some strongman acts and he he kind of switched more to the physique because many people were fascinated with the guy's musculature. He was very lean. I think he's like five ten, well, two hundred pounds, but he, he looked great. And even Alan Calvert. Uh, who started me, Milo Barbell back in 1902, he was quoted as saying, show me 10 guys who want to be as strong as Sandow, and I'll show you 100 who want to look like him. And that's what I found fascinating when interviewing all these guys, because the vast majority of guys, they just didn't want to be a pure this or that. They wanted to look good and be strong. They wanted both. They wanted to have one. I just do you know any guys who said, "Hey, I want to just have this great physique, but I have no strength whatsoever," <laughs> or some guy who's going to be really strong? Tragically, yeah, tragically, that is the attitude that's pervaded modern bodybuilding. But that's a very new phenomenon. That's that's a first yeah. century phenomenon. Yeah, it wasn't going on back then. These guys had, you know, you can't help but uh, when you lift, you, the side effect is growing muscle. And if you have a good genetics, a good natural aesthetic, that you're going to look really good. But a lot of these guys, some of them were just like burly endomethyl, endomethyl, so they would carry more body. They had a lot of muscle and strength, but they had thick joints. And these were like Louis Sarah. He could, I don't think he was ever defeated in a, in a, in a strong man act. And, you know, the challenge that was out there with him and Sandow. Uh, but even not the, the, the step aside from the big guys, even the, have you heard of Max Sick, Max Sick, no, Max Alden, the Max Alden exercise? You know, he, he, he's a guy five foot four, you know, 155, 160 pounds, and he had this incredible rip physique, and he had this outstanding muscle control where he could literally pop one ab at a time and, you know, make his chest expand like crazy, his back, and, but he was extremely strong. But over in England, Max was actually Swiss parents born in Germany. But he, he traveled to London to take on Thomas Inch, who was a very famous English lifter back then, middleweight world weightlifting champion at that time. This is before the Bala or the British Amateur Weightlifting Association was start. It was getting started, but nothing was official. So you still had weightlifting championships, but nothing was officially recorded for you know for for records and that. But he took on he was he wanted to take on Thomas Inch, but he ended up taking on Edward Aston at the time, another great lifter. But you know, this little guy, five foot four, hundred and sixty five pounds, he was putting over over three hundred pounds over his head. But they were competing with all sorts of these different lifts. And it what like I said, it wasn't until the it was oh, that was about nineteen ten. And it was in 1911 that the British Amateur Weightlifting Association actually did come to bear and start standardizing amateur lifting. And the professionals, again, the beer hall stuff, the, those, those claims and that, there's always been controversy around them. The United States, they started to stand, standardize a little bit later on that 1920 under George Jowett and Alan Colbert with the, I mean, the American Continental Weightlifting Association. But it was the AEU took it over in 1928. And a lot of the lifts were dropped. When he went with the press, the clean and jerk, and the, the and the snatch, but there were some interesting things that took place in the 1920s. Um, as I mentioned, Alan Calvert started Milo Milo Barbell in 1902, and he was putting out he 
kind of credited a bit with the double progressive system of, uh, you know, working with a weight for starting with five reps, working with that weight to get to 10 reps, then you increase the weight. That became pretty standard for many, many years. So you've been working out three times a week, 45 minutes of a shot. And those pamphlets, it kind of turned into Strength Magazine by 1914. Strength Magazine became pretty prominent in American lifting back then. But Calvert, he's known for his book, Super Strength, that he put out in 1924. And again, he had, he defected. He, after on super strength, he he backtracked out of heavy lifting. And he started criticizing, and he started calling a lot of the lifters fake. And he brought up this this kind of debate about made strength versus natural strength. And the fakers had this made strength that they they weren't as strong as they looked. They were they were getting leverage, and it was kind of the illusion of strength. Where George Jowett, another prominent physical culture and lifter at that time, who came, also came in to work for. Um, Milo Barbell, Calvert sold it, right? And Jowett came in and he was, he was big on weightlifting and he said, you know, that's, you know, bullshit. There's only one strength and that's natural strength and how you're born with it and how you build it up with uh, heavy training. And it kind of came this little bit of a rift of uh, philosophy. When Calvert took on this more of this calisthenic stuff, he started to say, you know, you gotta be trained more just for conditioning, trained for shape and whatever, and your know, strength will follow that. And Cal, uh, George Jowett was more along the philosophy of, you know, you train for strength. And whatever shape would naturally follow. So you got these two different philosophies, and Sig Klein kind of was leaning at that time towards Calvert, and Bob Hoffman obviously towards Jowett. And you can see how these two different philosophies came down the pike with um, with uh, Hoffman affecting, you know, Arthur Jones too he would say, you know, it's just genetics. You train to be strong, and whatever genetics your body will d- allow you to have, that will happen. But the weeders took on the more bodybuilding. Well, Jones, Jones was philosophy. very deeply uh, committed to the idea that the uh Size and sh- size and strength were intertwined. That any any improvement in strength would manifest itself in an improvement in size, and vice versa. That's right. So he just is a, a train, but make the body stronger, and it's just your genetics are going to dictate how you look. Basically, that's how Jones really pushed and based that. On, and, and if I can, just from because I'm the technical geek, based on the scientific information available at the time, that was an extremely reasonable and rational attitude. Uh, it turns out, you know, in in the light of m- truly modern science. There's a little more to it than that. But based on what was known about physiology at the time, that really was the, quote, correct answer. Yeah, and but not not everybody agreed with them. The bodybuilders, like on the West Coast guys, they just didn't believe when they, they believed they could attack muscles from different angles and certain other smaller muscles that enhance the other muscles. So they thought they could change for shape. But you, you, I, my point was that you see how the weeders, they start to split away. Like during, I kind of, I kind of jumped ahead quite a bit here. I'm going to go back again because when... Uh, uh, during that time, again, with uh, like Ezra Sandow, they were performing uh, Strongman acts, and he was looking good doing physique shots. Sandow ran a physique competition over in London. Benar McFadden ran one 1903 over here. And uh, but uh, weightlifting was getting underway. There was no real powerlifting, but uh, the there were still people doing deadlifts. Like you've heard of Herman Gorner. Like I mean, the guy sure. was a uh, uh, power. He was a strong, strong. Now again, his lifts aren't official. Like I mean, they are saying he could. Deadlift lift over 800 pounds back in the 1920s, which was a big lift. And he had some bars, too, where one of them, they say, was 2.8 inches, which I thought, uh, that's a big bar to be lifting a lot. A lot of weight. So how much? But nobody denies that Garner was a powerhouse and he was a deadlifter. And at the same time, Henry Steenborn, Milo Steenborn, was popularizing the squat, and it said that he could rock a 550-pound barbell up onto his shoulders, which is like. I'd, I'd want to see that. I mean, that would be an amazing feat. And he started doing flat-footed squatting because squatting back then, people were doing very light weights and kind of coming up on the, the name, toes. What was the name of the lift? It was the basically the original squat. And it's named after an individual, and I can't remember. But the bar would be laying on the floor like a deadlift. You would put collars, really tight collars on the bar, and you would literally stand a bar up on end and then shoulder it and, and basically tip it into a squat position. Well, I think that's what they're talking about that Steenborn did. Yeah, and he did a full extreme. squat. It, it, it's, it's known today as a name, and maybe it's a Steinborn squat. I'm not sure, but I, I know of that. Um, I know yeah. that actually because, ironically, my grandfather was a, a muscle head. He was a physical culture guy. And my grandfather used to do those in the backyard. <laughs> I literally you know, yeah. watched a, a mammoth of a man. My grandfather was an enormous, you know, you know, in, in a, you know his heyday was the 1950s. He was six okay. foot, 300 pounds. In the 1950s, exactly. he was an absurdity. Yeah. And to How see much a man like use? that, you know, tipping a 300-pound barbell onto his back and whacking full squats, 
it, uh, yeah, it's, that, it's that's reasonable. The five, yeah, the 550 pounds, I thought, I'd want to see that. Because that's an enormous barbell, even just to be hiking up to stand on its end, let alone to, to bend it and keep control and get up on your back. Because that's 250 pounds more than your grandfather was doing. Right. So and he, that's he a was lot a giant of it. Yeah, okay, well, we'll give it to Henry for this. For for now, we'll give it. But he he started popularizing that flat-footed squat. Mark Berry, who uh, he was starting to uh, get in more into the squatting as well. I think, I think Berry was a tribute to building some squat racks because the rim of the 20-rep 20, the 20 squat routine was going to become popular in the sure. 30s with Joseph Curtis Heiss. And again, again, no real official bodybuilding contests were going on at that time. No official powerlifting was going on. There was weightlifting. Bob Hoffman was establishing himself as the patriarch of... American bodybuilding through the 1930s because he had that oil burning industry that did very well through the depression era and when everybody else was hurting and he actually took over Milo Barbell and he took over Strength Magazine in 1935. He started his own magazine, Health, Strength and Health in 1932. Health and Strength uh, in the UK was started in 1898, uh, way back and still running today. Uh, uh, Eugene Sandell started his physical culture magazine uh, just around the turn of the teens. Same with uh, Bernard McFadden, his magazine. So there were magazines out there at the time during 1910, 1920, because there was a lot of these guys, these strong men were born uh, you know, between 1860 and 1880 and, and had their heydays through the 1890s and early 1900s. And because the vaudeville was coming to the end, you know, around the 1930s. Yeah, remember the name Joseph Greenstein, uh, uh, the Mighty Adam. Another guy, five foot, five foot four, super. He, this guy was kind of like a mind over. He has, he had a pretty good physique, but his his feats of strength were his mind over matter. Like he could just, he did, he could fly. He hung suspended from an airplane with his by his hair. He held back a certain level airplane with his hair. It was he was kind of like this you know, young Samson. It was he, he Joseph Greenstein, amazing guy. Vic Boff wrote about him, and there's a the the producer of the Kung Fu series. Oh, what's his name? Uh, he wrote a book, uh, the the Mighty Adam, the, the Amazing Story of Joseph Greenstein. It's a great read. I think Randall Strawson sells that book or did sell that book. I may look for that. I wrote about him in Volume One, The Mighty Adam, Samson Reborn, because I was so uh, fascinated with his, with that man because he he um he, you know uh, superstar Billy Grand, a wrestler, right? Absolutely, I've met him. Wayne Coleman, he's a monster. And uh, Dan Lurie was friends with uh, Joseph Greenstein. Joseph Greenstein was now 77 years, about this time in the 1970s. He was at lunch with Billy Graham and Joseph Greenstein. you got to remember, Billy Graham, 6'4", at this time, 275. Uh, Joseph Greenstein, 77, he's 5'4". He's probably lucky if he's even 5'4", at this time, 130 pounds. Old man. And Greenstein said, I could hold you, Billy Graham, uh, back with one, with one th- finger on your forehead. Billy was a good guy. Graham, well, Graham was a really good guy, and he sure he could try it. And Dan said, uh, Joseph put one finger on his forehead, probably on his third eye area, what they want to call that. And he said Graham was bur- turning purple and pushing, pushing on that finger, and, uh, uh, and he could not budge. And then uh, he told Billy Graham, "You try to stop me." And Billy Graham put his finger on uh, Joseph's head, and Dan said he walked right through Big Billy Graham. This guy was wow. amazing. He used the mind over matter. But that, again, that was he was in. Near the end of vaudeville in the 1930s, and there was a weightlifting going on. I said Bob Hoffman was building up his uh, his control over American weightlifting, and he became to have apps. He was the first real uh, monopoly uh, over American bodybuilding iron game because by the 1940s, he we had our first Mister America uh, contest run by the AAU. Some argue it was 1939, and that was John Gramick. Again, John Gramick, a bodybuilder and a weightlifter. You see, these guys are still crossing over, and. Again, Hoffman, with the AAU, controlled all amateur sports at that time, including weightlifting. The weightlifting had an AAU committee, a national weightlifting committee, that controlled all amateur weightlifting. Anybody wanting to go through the Olympics had to go through the AAU in the United States, the Amateur Athletic Union. And in basketball, track and field, the AAU was you had to go through them to hit the Olympics. Now, bodybuilding had nothing to shoot for for the Olympics. They were just getting started. But Bob Hoffman kept control of bodybuilding. He didn't like it. Bob didn't like bodybuilding. He didn't like bodybuilders, but bodybuilders uh, bought equipment and they were good for the muscle market. So Bob and the, and the AAU, they kept control over the, that sport. So from 1940, 41, 
Graham Eck wins it, but he's he's a weightlifter and a bodybuilder. I think you know, even Frank Wright, who won in 42, Jules Bacon in 43, these guys are all York guys. See Hoffman's you know, basically manipulating the, the vote here. Dan Lurie, he was strictly more of a bodybuilder at that time. He was always getting the most muscular guy, but he was just always denied to Mr. America. 1944, again, uh, Steve Stanko, m- monster guy, world weightlifting champion at the time. At one time, he it was given to him, but he, he was a big guy, a lot of muscle, but he really wasn't a Mr. America type shape and again they gave uh, Steve the first Mr. Universe contest in 1947 in Philadelphia which was pretty highly controversial but my point here is that you can see now a lot of the strongman acts were kind of uh, from the vaudeville and the circus scene they were yielding now to uh, organized weightlifting and now bodybuilding powerlifting still didn't have any real vehicle but there were guys now that that was still the purview of quote odd lifts um, yes. The yes. 40s, they were there on was them. no system, systematic, standardized powerlifting. It was not yet. The yeah. Not this, yeah. The, the they were, but we said oddity. You know, the squat and deadlift were kind of things they were coming you around. To train for weightlifting. <laughs> Yeah, they were, yep, yeah, that, exactly. It was all part of weightlifting, but like Henry popularized the, the flat-footed squat, back squat, and guys like Herman Gorner, they, he was popularizing the deadlift, so these guys were using the deadlift squat, and bench pressing still was, everybody said, the word back then, what can you press? What can you press? And the press was dominant. What can you lift up or take off racks and press over your head? Right. The bench yeah. press wasn't really popular at this time, but the, as you mentioned, the odd lifts were starting to come into play because uh, Leo Stern uh, does that name ring a bell to you Leo he's just passed away about four years ago he ran his gym out in San Diego for years he was the mentor to Bill Pearl Leo was a bodybuilder and he was a, a, a strength guy again a, a hybrid a power bodybuilder most of the guys I really met that, that I know are that they like they're bodybuilders or, and they do all the power lifts and some of them well, do power well, lifting I, I try so hard not to interject, but I'll interject a personal quick story right here because it, it's exactly perfect to what you were saying. I uh, worked out, um, I will say with because that's very bold, but I worked out the same facility immediately next to Ed Cohn, who's probably the greatest powerlifter of all time. And he, you know, he went through his deadlift workout, and I, I worked out as best I could, but truly I was there to fucking stare at Ed and watch him do his thing. Yeah, and okay. at the end of his workout, Oddly, he turns to the mirror and he hit a lat spread. And he looks over at me and smiles and he goes, every powerlifter is a closet bodybuilder. And he put his stuff in his bag and left. And I just exactly. thought that was the funniest remark. Uh, just That's so what I casual mean. And, 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 and just bubbled out of it. It was funny. They all like the look, right? I mean, a good strong look. Like a Bill Pearl... A lot of guys like you get the split. You get guys who like Steve Reese. He had the you know great aesthetic, but a lot of guys like the Graham. They like the Bill Pearl, the the Reg Park looks because Reg Park coming into the fifties. The four, actually, I was going to say, um, Leo Stern ran uh, a contest, an odd lift contest in nineteen forty eight, where they oh, did do deadlifts, bench press, squat, the curl, and the pullover. You know, I always thought the curl's a good. Uh, test the strength. They uh, they should have probably kept that in because they many the the curl contests have went on for years and years and years putting their backs against posts, seeing what a guy can just curl pure raw curling strength. But uh, that got dropped by the nineteen sixty mid sixties out of the powerlifting uh, when powerlifting came to be. But during the nineteen fifties. <clears throat> you get a number of strong guys coming around here. They're bodybuilders, powerlifters, weightlifters, early powerlifters, I'd say, but they're still weightlifters and bodybuilders. Guys like Marvin Eater, incredibly strong guy. Uh, Doug Hepburn, Canadian, 1952. Yeah, guys are pressing, yeah, pressing and squatting enormous amounts of weights. Reg Park, supposedly one of the first to bench press 500 pounds, but Marvin Eater, I think, has claimed he benched. 500 pounds, you know, there's talk that Paul Anderson benched for 500 pounds, but, you know, these things happen in, in the gyms, but Anderson was a freak, right? I mean, he he won a gold medal in weightlifting in 1956. He would have won it again in 1960, but he was deemed a professional, wasn't allowed to, yeah. to now, compete. Again, just to interject, because, again, because it's just my world, I don't find it a coincidence that both the prowess and the appearance, and possibly even the proliferation of these types of athletes really spiked right around that 1948, 1950 mark, which is also the time when commercial testosterone became available. 
Yeah, actually, commercial testosterone was available in the forties. Like it, uh, it was, but it was very, very. Um, it wasn't. Was, it wasn't the information highway, right, was it? It wasn't like very today. Much insider we got the information, but by the you had ha- yeah, you had to be falling the into chronology. But Paul exactly, de Kroof, yeah. yeah, Paul de Kroof has. Uh, he wrote the book, The Male Hormone, nineteen forty-five, yes. where he was he was fielding the question: If this can do this for uh, convalescing patients, what could it do for? I yes. forget the, the professional teams he uses that if they got a hold of this. But yeah, you're correct. Even I, I did a little podcast a few weeks ago about sprinting, about the sprints and comparing like Hussein Bolt and uh, and uh, Jesse Owens, and I also addressed that period through the fifties, especially the fifties and the sixties at the the field was starting to change a little bit but you're right during the 50s we had a number of big lifters and from the late 50s into the 60s uh, even out on the west coast you're getting guys showing up like pat casey steve marjorie i was going to go i was going to go directly to pat casey because exactly that chuck aaron just a classic example of a physique that could not be sustained without drugs i I mean no disrespect i'm i'm very positive on the man, but you just don't find that morphology in a non-drug using athlete. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, Margini was another powerhouse guy, uh, like Chuck Aarons. Again, uh, Aarons never competed in anything, so his lists aren't official in the question, but I'm good friends with Don Holworth, who was 1967 Mr. America. Don was a strong guy. He trained with these guys. They're all buddies. He said uh, when they were at Pasadena Gym, before they went to Vince's Gym, they were all training at Pasadena Gym. Oh, hang on a sec there. Um, it, it was Gene Mosey's gym. Was it Pasatina's gym? I don't want to get these names mixed up, but because uh, Bill Pearl took over George Redpath's gym, and that's I think Pat Casey was there. But these guys are all mixing around, and Casey would show up with a trunk full of raw milk, and these guys would be just down in a gallon of raw milk during their workout. But these often at that time the workouts could go two to two to four hours. But uh, Aaron's Don said Chuck Aaron's. He said uh, he goes, Man, I couldn't tell you exactly to the ounce. How many, how much weight he had on those dumbbells, but he goes, geez, they were huge. He said he had 35s on there, 25s there. They had to be well over 200 pounds each. And he was doing presses, you know, claim presses with them. So he was quite a, quite a strong guy because this, we're getting into the era now where, again, the United States now is starting to, because of the Russians, we're openly using drugs. And there's, there's that controversy is how steroids came into, uh, the American and Western. It, it was a much easier inf- influence influx of drugs into the Soviet Union. They're way more open to it than, say, the Western culture where they were kind of, Ziegler's kind of uh, assigned that role, bring it in the late 50s. But we we know that Ziegler was experimenting a little bit with uh, um, uh, John Gramick in the 1950s, 1954, him and uh, Jim Parks. That, uh, But Hoffman said, okay, he stopped at that time. Well, did he? We don't know. I know that talking with Ray Marcunis in uh, Chicago, he knows, that, well, quite sure that uh Real Blair, still at Urban Johnson at that time, had uh, Nilovar. He called it a nitrogen pill. It was white, and he said it was made by Sorrel, right? So Mark Coon said, well, let me try it. And uh, Blair at that time was a little bit more conservative. He said, no, he goes, I don't know enough about this yet. So Blair was kind of protecting this young guy from using the drug at the time. But this is 1958, and it was definitely in Chicago. Mark Coon said it could have been as early as 1956. So when Blair came out to California, yeah, he now, had the knowledge. Clear, just to be clear, you know, for some of the people that are listening and maybe aren't, as uh, savvy here, we're, we're now talking about synthetic derivatives of testosterone. We're talking yes. about true anabolic steroids like Dianabol, yes. Nelivar, Anavar, those sorts of things. You know, again, testosterone goes all the way back to the late 1890s um, and was, you know, being used to a small degree. And well, they were looking for it. They were looking up. for what it was, but it wasn't isolated. Basically, officially, Correct. I'll say officially, it wasn't isolated to the 1930s and Nobel Prize that, given absolutely 39. Absolutely correct. Yes. But it Ziegler was, worked um, with Siba. Ziegler actually worked with Siba to correct. tweak testosterone molecule to enhance the anabolic and to reduce the androgenic effect and now, create. Now the anabolic. version I heard, and this is this is pure hearsay, but yeah. uh, I heard this from a, a another fairly knowledge historian that Ziegler had gone to Eastern Europe and actually found uh, it was either methyl testosterone or a a slight derivation of methyl testosterone that was being used by the DDR, the the East German uh, drug program, and he patterned Dianabol off of that. I don't know if that's accurate, but it, it actually sounds surprisingly sensible. Well, you probably got some ideas. He, he absolutely was in Vienna in 1954, and he absolutely himself has, has done in interviews stated 
he had spoken with the Soviet coaches and was totally informed about their use of at least testosterone at the time. He said he was horrified at some of the, even the female athletes at that at that particular period because he said they could have played with the Washington Redskins. But it, in Germany, he, there's no doubt that's a possibility. He was in communication with these guys and could have got information if they were starting to tweak, you know, that testosterone molecule before SIBA. You know, SIBA doesn't necessarily the first guys to do it. The farming community, they, you know, Nilovar. When was Nilovar? Oh, they might have beaten SIBA. Sorrow might have beaten SIVA as well. Like I, I just concluded that there were many more channels out there in, to put steroids than just John Ziegler in, in late 1950s, right? Because yeah. method, there was a, was a, um, Osmo Kia and Mike Bondurant both have abs, ads that were circa 1947-48 with uh, SIBA advertising methyl testosterone to strength athletes. Correct. I wanted to get a pitch. I wanted to get a copy of that for the volume one, but I never did get that uh, copy. But so yeah, we ha- we have steroids coming into the game now, and they're definitely by the early night. Bill Pearl admitted to start taking testosterone or Nilovar in 1958. Right. And Bill used steroids, I, I might believe, pretty much through the rest of his his career, uh, which there is some controversy there, but we won't dwell on that. But <laughs> by nineteen. Oh, I, yeah, I know, I know. I, I don't want to try. Bill's a great guy. He was a great ambassador for the sport. So I, I don't want to, you know, beat up on Bill Pro. He's an icon in the industry. And he's a good guy. I've talked to him several times. But by 1964, here we got the power list. It, it, again, I've been saying a lot on the American side of the Atlantic. It, it, there's been a parallel growth on the other side of, of, the, of the Atlantic, you know, as, you know with the ball. Yes. Yeah, in England and in France, where they're, where they're bodybuilding, the growth of bodybuilding, the growth of weightlifting and powerlifting. Like, I mean, these guys are all doing these lists, and not everybody was genetically suited to be a weightlifter, especially when they dropped the all the other lifts and just went with the press and the the clean and jerk and the snatch. Now, the press still kept a certain marriage with the power the powerlifting guys, early powerlifting guys, and the bodybuilders because it was just it, you could take it off the rack, so you could get up, you just press it over. You didn't have to have the this this more technique in gymnastics, especially in the snatch. If you didn't have the biomechanics for that, the, the limb proper limb lengths and stuff, it, that's a very those are diff- difficult lists. So, but and the natural but, aptitude for speed. Exactly, it is a it is a speed oriented movement. So by 1964, the AAU stepped up and they ran their first show. Terry Todd won the won the first I think super heavyweight night late 1964. Those records weren't counted because officially they started a clean slate in 1965. But again, another sport Hoppin didn't like. But he he was a pure weightlifter. But again, like bodybuilding, powerlifters. And bodybuilders are pushed to the side, but he's still going to control them because by now Ironically, he he knows the I value may, of the muscle industry. He's got I control know, of the market. I may actually know a little historical fact that you do not, uh, although that's bold of me to say. But probably full of shit. But I don't know everything. Something something that's interesting. Speaking of Bob Hoffman and powerlifting, yeah. Bob Hoffman vehemently despised powerlifting, yet he held. The first World Powerlifting Championship. Yeah, in 1971 or 72. Uh, November 6, 1971, which yeah. co- coincidentally happens to be my birthday. And that even I didn't more know. ironically, lifting commenced, <laughs> I, lifting commenced at 9.30 a.m. When you were born? The, the moment I was born, I literally came to this earth as there the was first a competitive guy. powerlifting <laughs> World Championship commenced. That's funny. That's it's, actually pretty cool. Weird. Yeah, I know he ran the first world championships, but again, my point was, here he is, he, he doesn't like it, like bodybuilding, but he's got such control of the muscle market, which really exploded in the early 50s when supplements came in. So he knows bodybuilders are swallowing this stuff like crazy, the powerlifters are swallowing this stuff like crazy, they're buying his equipment. He came out the power racks in early, you know, 1960s, so he wants to control that market, so even though he doesn't like these disciplines, he's going to uh, try to keep control of them. What really happened in that in 1972, um, Hoffman was running these world championships, but at that time, um, Askham wrote something. I thought he thought this is a key key point in time when powerlifters and bodybuilders probably united more with each other, and weightlifting went away adrift when they dropped the press. It was in 1972, they dropped the press and just went with the snatch and the clean and jerk. So now weightlifting was entirely a very, very high-skilled movement. And the powerlifting was really starting to get underway. Because at that time now, you had Jim Williams. And Pat Casey, uh, they said unofficially, um, bent 600 pounds. Yeah. So by, by 1970, 
six seventy one. He had Jim Williamson. I think he was up around six sixty with his yeah. bench press. He had John Cook. You know, John Cole were there. You know, Don Reinhold. You know, he's a monster of a, of a guy. So the, these powerlifters, and you can see how genetics now are really kind of in the sixties. Still, uh, you know the name Bill Cino, right? Sure. Oh, the Chicago. There's a guy who competed at a national level and won in, in powerlifting, weightlifting, and bodybuilding. Now, like I mean, that is an elite. Something completely unheard of in modern era. Yeah, yeah, and then you won't get that today. But I mean, Bill, like Bob Guider was the, Mr. America. He was competing, at least competing at the senior national weightlifting. So there were still the hybrids, right? These guys loved them both. They weren't. They, even John Grimmick did not like Hoffman. Ditching, calling the bodybuilders Mr. Long, Mr. Ingrown Toenails, Mr. Weedy, the wonderful Weedy. This he said, listen, you know, there, there's room, there's room here because Gramic was a strong guy and a weightlifter, but he's a bodybuilder too, right? So Hoffman, he created Hoffman was smart enough to know this, and with powerlifting taking off in the mid '60s, he started muscular development and put uh, Gramic in charge of that because that body that was going to become a bodybuilding powerlifting magazine, and the strength and health was going to stay more oriented towards uh, you know his weightlifting and stuff. And they still they controlled the Mr. America as still through the 1960s, but that too was starting to get some. They were trying to uh, keep it from going too crazy into the bodybuilding. They, that's why they they set up the scoring in the 1950s to make sure Mr. America was scored with. 25% muscularity, 25% symmetry, 25% uh, strength, you know, athletic ability, and 25 general appearances. They wanted it all around Mr. America who could speak and be athletic, and it was still being slanted towards weightlifting. They wouldn't have, if the bodybuilder could bench 500 pounds, uh, they, they, that didn't count, you know? Right. It, 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 which is ridiculous. All the weightlifting, all the the clean and jerks and the press that counted, but a, a 500 pound uh, pre bench press meant nothing for athletic points. And Don Horn said that this was crazy. Like Don was strong enough to muscle out a lot of his points. Just you know, go. He had to go to a, a, a local AAU place and do a few lifts and stuff. And even though Don said he had no interest in Olympic lifts, he didn't dis, he didn't disrespect it. He just didn't do Olympic weightlifting. He liked bench press and. It's, and like all those guys on the West Coast, like Casey and Marjani, well, Marjani like the incline press, but there's a lot of strong guys in that. But by 1972, just, with the press... Just be, you're being the historian, I really want your thoughts on this, because these are the sorts of things that I think of all the time. Although I'm really, you kind of make my, my, my money in the, in the strength world, bodybuilding is, of course, always in my mind, and it, it's even where I began in the world. Anyway... How much do you think the geography, the culture of the geography, east to west, changed that attitude away from the athletic abilities of the east coast to more the cosmetic demands of the west coast? That's a good question. Um, yeah, because it's almost like the East had that real strength and hard lifting philosophy where the West Coast, you know, but they still have some serious hit. Like Armand Tanny, well, he came from the East. He came from Rochester. He went out to Buffalo Beach in 1930. I mean, I mean no disrespect to the West Coast. I know, Coast. but I mean it's not. Like it's a good point. Here. I don't mean it that way. I just mean, I think as the population of this country moved West, the demand for that work ethic moved more toward a demand for an aesthetic. Yeah, I'll give you a back up your point here too. Uh, in the 50s, uh, even late 40s and 50s, before the 60s, guys like Vince Toronto, even real uh, Irvin Johnson went from Chicago and he really pooped all over squats and he he became Irvin, he became real Blair, moved to the West Coast right. and he and he and um, even back when he was in Chicago still, he was he was kind of going against the heavy lifting but Toronto was really into, he was also into that train for shape and strength to follow and uh, that different interest. philosophy. Yeah. And even Ken Leisner is, you know, into strength. He's, you know, Doc Ken. He, he, I quoted him in volume one. He, he was gracious enough to be honest and say, you know, when he went to draw and met Drawn uh, at his gym, he admit though, like, we both know, Ken could have blown Vince out of the water in the, in the, in the power lifts. No problem, right? But he said, Vince performed some stunts and muscular endurance stunts. And, uh, Ken said, I couldn't do it. He goes, I didn't even bother trying because I know he couldn't do it. But, Ken wasn't interested in doing it. It's like a marathon runner, right? Like, I mean, okay, yeah, I can't run a marathon. Do I want to? No. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, where you, you specialize in what you want to specialize um, on. Kind of a gymnastic background. He was, you know, Dancing. A lot of he was a dancer, right? Yeah, with the pole holds and a lot of fancy dip maneuvers. And it, it always gave me a very uh, gymnastic vibe. 
Yeah, he could do a one-arm chin, though. Then that's right. a lot of strength. So he hit, see, these guys still had some crossover. Even though he was a bodybuilder, he could do that. Not many many guys can do a one-arm chin. And oh, are you that, 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 today, uh, there's probably ten or twelve guys on earth that can do that. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. Boyer Cole could With do that. Loaded, inflated body weights of people. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to see a two hundred pound asshole do a one-arm chin. <laughs> Yeah, but, the, you know, these guys, to your point about that West Coast, you know, lay on the beach, uh, have a good look, you know, that thing. It's true. Like, I mean, even our man Tanny on the East Coast, was pure weightlifting, and uh, when he went to the West Coast, he got into more in the bodybuilding, but he was still a power bodybuilder. Like um, Jeff Everson said, you know, later in years, you can see uh, our man's hands, the damage of his hands, because he could do a one arm, with one arm, do a 300-pound clean to the neck, right? Yeah. That's a lot of strength, and you know our man could, was doing that for you. He still he liked the squats. He, he you looked at his physique. He had a strong looking physique, but typically, yeah, the, the, there was a difference in in philosophies, in, especially in the late sixties and early seventies, where when Arthur Jones came out with his general prescription of this train heavy brief and stuff, where the West Coast guys said bullshit. We we've been building muscle way before you came along. They, they had a different philosophy. They had more of that training for shape and the strengthening following, and there was arguments. Even that uh, Bob Clark, that they they I know Dan Mackey when he I talked to him before he passed away was adamant that Arthur copied Bob Clark for the for the camp and there's a story I I, I tell that story in volume two because Bob Clark had an offset wheel to creating a, a cam like thing back in 1958 in Bill Pearl's gym and Jim Carlin was out there and, and he also saw it and Don Horace said he actually liked that machine Don was a free weight guy but he said that bicep machine was really cool and Arthur saw it but Bill Pearl doesn't accuse me he said he knew Bob Clark and he knew Arthur Jones and he does not accuse Arthur of stealing that he said Arthur was brilliant he understood the concepts at the time but he said Arthur did see it so there's that west coast east coast the little rivalry yeah. going in a different dynamic there, right? I've done an awful lot of studying on Arthur <laughs> Jones. I've, I've spoken in person with his son um, and, and all the, the whole fleet of Nautilus guys, and, and I'm a huge Jones fan, but I'll tell you something about that I personally discern about his psyche. He may have seen that machine, but Jones was very much one of those guys that if it wasn't his idea, it probably wasn't a good idea. Yes, that's a good point, too. And, and I suspect, no matter what he saw, wherever, it really wasn't a case of him stealing it because I, I think I think that idea would have come to him independently, or not would have, but did come to him independently at a later date. Well, Gary Jones says he's the one who came with it. Like, I mean, at least yes, what Gary, Gary told Gary me. Gary Jones is, is, in my mind, accredited with... Yeah, he's a good guy. Gary's a good yeah. guy. Um, yeah. Arthur was drawing up a gearbox system by 1969, clutch. looking for something yeah, different. Clutch. Yeah, yeah. And Gary said what he was looking at, even just the shape of the box, he said a cam. And Arthur had Gary actually make up what he was talking about doing the cam. And that's in, Gary was in between getting smacked around by Arthur. You yeah. know, poor yeah. Gary was out in the factory doing, trying to come up with a lot of stuff with bending the iron around into certain shapes and stuff. So yeah, the, the point was that we we're talking about this East Coast, West Coast stuff with a different difference in philosophy to your question about was there more of a bodybuilding? Absolutely. There was more of a, it seemed to be more of that bodybuilding attitude on the West Coast, but the East Coast where they were strength oriented in it and they still were bodybuilding had that bodybuilding mind Weeder was still on New Jersey he made the move in 1972 but he opened up his first office in 1963 he sent Dave Draper you know California's beach boy we all grew up reading about Dave Absolutely. on the beach he came from New Jersey in 1963 you know never been on the beach on the west coast in his life and he he, op he started him and George Eiferman who was out in the west coast they start opened up Joe's first uh, office out in 1963 and then Joe moved his office west in 1972 so there was a sh definitely a shift in bodybuilding moving to the West Coast. But again, powerlifting, there's a, another major thing happened here in the 1970s. And that was the uh, sport that was going to finally, Hoffman's getting old now. He's 70, he was born in 1898, so 1970, 72 years old. He was getting a little senile um, and kind of losing some control and interest. York, he was getting quite curmudgeon. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And so by... Weeder, again, Oscar State was a powerful figure in the International Weightlifting Federation. He liked, took a liking to Ben Weeder back in the 50s. 
And by 1968, he knew what the Weightlifting Federation was going to do. He knew they were going to dump bodybuilding because the International Weightlifting Federation, they also sanctioned uh, amateur bodybuilding worldwide. That's why Tommy Kono, a great lifter through the 50s, there's a guy who was missed five times. Thick Mr. Universe. Like, I mean, there's the, the criticism there is Tommy won the Mr. Universe five times, but he wasn't competing against the top bodybuilders because they, they were all disqualified because they were not part of the AAU. But Tommy was a fantastic world-class weightlifter, strength athlete, and uh, great physique as well, as did Bill March, actually one of the first guys who's just saying using Diana Ball. But uh, by <clears throat> 1972, in, in Oscar State had got Ben Weider to restructure the IFBB, that's the International Federation of Bodybuilders, the, uh, the, the major international governing body for the sport today, and Oscar was instrumental in bringing these uh, national affiliates that were part of the International Weightlifting Federation over to the IFEB and also getting uh, the IFEB was GASA status, General, General Association of International Sports Federation. This was a new organization started in, the, in 1968 that was going to be a, a coordinating body that was going to interact with the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and it was going to give recognition to sports that weren't didn't have IOC recognition yet. So it was kind of important to get that status, and Oscar was important in getting the IFEB the status, which means that the the powerful AAU weightlifting committee was going to have to start taking notice of Weider, whether they didn't like whether liked him or not, because what I didn't mention in this conversation yet, all through the 40s and 50s and 60s, there was an enormous war between Hoffman and the Weeders. They did not like each other. They were in court several times. And yeah, it was a anybody financial getting, war, yeah. <laughs> anybody getting caught in... Um, Going to any IFBB contest from the uh, in 1906, they they immediately lost their AAU status, and uh, for a, for a bodybuilder, it didn't mean anything because there was no Olympics to go to. But anybody who had any uh, weightlifting aspirations, they that was a disaster for them. So well, there was a big you, rift you there. You say that, that it was meaningless, but that may actually be the brilliance of the weeders by creating the quote professional division. Yeah, they did make sort of a bodybuilding Olympics. No matter how trivial it was, it, w it was real. They had to make the, the profession. Even before the weeders, Joe at the beginning had no interest in competition. When he hooked up with Dan Lurie in 1940s, early 40s, Joe, Joe was interested, and he told Dan this, and this, if you believe Dan, he said Joe was interested in the merchandising the sport. He wanted to sell, he wanted to sell equipment, he wanted to sell magazines. And uh, again, he said to, to, to uh, Dan, "There's no, there's no money in competitions," and that was indicative because it was Dan running the AAU contest in 1944, 45, 46. Dan lost his AAU status, and when it was George Jowett and uh, Emmanuel Orlick who were instrumental in structuring and setting up the IFBB with with the weeders. Now, I went through this very in detail in Volume 1 as to exactly when the IFBB got started because there's a lot of controversy there. The weeders said they've been running shows since 1946 and that's not necessarily true. That, the IFBB really didn't start getting underway until 1948 and then it went dormant all through the 50s. It was very, you know, not important at all because AAU was too powerful. The NABA was getting started over across the Atlantic but the weeders didn't kickstart the IFBB to 1959 and, but during the 1950s, Walt Baptiste and uh, Burt Goodridge, they were running, because of the AAU, they had to run professional shows. <clears throat> they ran a professional Mr. USA. They ran a professional Mr. America. Our man Tanny won the Mr. USA. It was a fairly prestigious title because those are top bodybuilders. John Grimmick competed in that. Steve Reese competed in that in 1948 yeah. and 49, right? NAB was running a Mr. Universe. They had, because nobody recognized the AAU and the International Weightlifting Federation. They didn't recognize NAB as amateur. They didn't recognize Weeders as amateur. So, Again, this big shift in power was going to take place because the weeders, when they became the recognized international governing body, they needed affiliates from each country, and they wanted the AAU to affiliate with them to represent American amateur bodybuilding. But York was in control. They just screw you. We're not have nothing to do with weeder. We don't care if he's got this case of status. But now Hoffman's getting older, and there were, what the big thing that happened here in the 1970s was the uh, 1978 Sports Act. And that, it was a very political movement that was going to divest the AAU and the NCAA with a lot of their control over amateur sports, and it was going to hand it over to the United States Olympic Committee. There was a lot of behind-the-scenes business, a lot of powerful men involved in here. Arthur Jones is button heads with them. I wrote about this in Volume 2. I won't get into that right now. But this gave this forced the AAU to, and the, that meant the National Weightlifting Committee had to relinquish control of bodybuilding and powerlifting. And there was some subcommittees, uh, AAU, uh, physique committee and AU powerlifting committee. These guys were now free from about the mid-70s to start to look to create their own national governing body 
And this gave, uh, for bodybuilding, I, I went into detail on this one. Ken Sprague was a very sharp guy, and he was instrumental in taking the AAU, and which became the NPC, and putting it, taking it from York, and installing Jim Mannion in 1977, keeping him in power in 1978, and again in 81. And so the bodybuilding went off with the uh, AAU became the NPC, and that's what we in the National Physique Committee. In powerlifting, okay, the AAU Powerlifting Committee, it became by 1970, late 70s, the United States uh, Powerlifting Federation, and it's, it was going to be affiliate. I'm jumping, I, I'll go back to 1972-73 when the International Powerlifting Federation be, began. Because you're correct, when Hoffman Randall's World Powerlifting Contest, it was right after that they started the International Powerlifting Federation, right. and they received gates of status. Now that IPF, it received the, uh, that uh, General Association of International Sports Federation. That was a, it was important for at that time for them to receive this because they're now the recognized international governing body for powerlifting, and they were going to have the United States um, uh, Powerlifting. Uh, Federation be their amateur amateur representative for the United States. And <clears throat> moving into the 1980s, when steroid testing became more prevalent, the, you probably know a lot of this history more than I do. I know that uh, there was pressure for the IPF to start drug testing. I believe there was more organizations split away from the United States Powerlifting Federation, what was the the American Drug Free Powerlifting uh, Association? The American Drug Free Powerlifting yeah. Association, which is now. The affiliate. Uh, in essence, the uh, USAPL. Yes, in 19, I, was it 1997 or 98 that the United States Powerlifting Federation got, wasn't cooperating with the drug testing. They got right. dumped, and then the, the, the American uh, Drug Free Powerlifting Association became the United States, USA Powerlifting, and they I'll became the American Powerlifting. I'll give you a little tip how old I am. My first powerlifting title was actually the ADFPA T National title uh, in 1986. 86. Yeah, yeah 86. well. Brother Bennett era. Okay, yeah, yeah, because they had, uh, yeah, that name brings a bell. Powerlifting, at this point, my focus will be kind of more on the, on the bodybuilding, but what, what happened now too, in the 70s, there were still very powerful, strong bodybuilders. So Franco Colombo, there's no doubt. Franco supposedly had about 190 pounds, bench 525, squatted 680, and, and deadlifted 750 pounds, which were very, very good lifts at the time. Franco was strong enough good lifts to... Good really. Pardon me? They're pretty good lifts at this time. Yes. Uh, he and Lou Ferrigno were invited to the very first World's Strongest Man. Strongest CBS man. put on the World's First Strongest Man. Now, so Strong Man was getting popular again. What goes around comes around, right? They were the first, actually. And they're coming around, and that first show in 77, I remember, I watched it. It was, they had Bruce Wilhelm, Don, Don Reinhardt, they had, uh, Ken Patera, I think Bob Young, football player, yep. uh, Lou Ferrigno and Franco. And, and it was funny, cause, you know, Lou and, uh, Franco were getting ridiculed. Bruce Wilhelm, he's kind of a colorful character. And he kept, they criticizing the bodybuilders, cause Lou and Franco won the bar band. He's like, okay, they got strong forearms. You <laughs> know, so he said, but they still don't belong here. But uh, Lou, Lou pissed them all off when he 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 helped them all in the car lift. And I remember one of them saying, "Well, it's just leverage." Well, it, it, exactly. That's what strength is. There's a lot of boat leverage. I mean, Lou's almost six five. You got at least give him some credit. He outlifted you when they loaded up the back of that car. And he he outlifted the uh, the power lifters and the weight lifters. I couldn't figure out how he did it either, but he did. He he came in fourth. So they still at that time. They could compete, but I know with, uh, later on they could not. You wouldn't see any of the bodybuilders in there. But some of the 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 the, the world strongest man, Wilhelm, he was a weightlifter. Again, there's uh, Alexiev didn't come from Russia. It was mostly American competitors. He well, Wilhelm won in '78. Don Reinhardt, he, he, there's a guy. He was lifting huge weights in powerlifting. Uh, these guys are now over 800 pounds deadlifting and. Uh, they, he won it in 79. Then the, the one of the most amazing guys I like watching back then was Bill Kazmaier. Absolutely. He won it. But he, you know, he placed third. Just, Go ahead. Just to throw in there, um, this is a very, in my mind, actually there's two things I want to throw in, but on this point, like you said in the, in that, um, like 20s and 30s and then again in the late 50s, early 60s, there was a fundamental shift in people perhaps drug-driven in the 40s and 50s, and then this, this like, 72 through 80 era, the morphology of the people, the actual athletes. Like, Reinhold, you could say all these great things about him, but nobody mentions he was just an enormous man. Drugs, yeah, yeah. no drugs, weightlifting, no weightlifting, whatever. He was just a massive dude. Yep. Yeah. And that radically impacted his abilities as a strongman. 
he was, you know, being well over six foot and well over 300 pounds gives you leverages and abilities that just are not available to the average man. It brings to the argument of genetics sifting out exactly. the pure guys, it, eh? It's the, it's, it's the it's marker happening. of the genetic differentiation. It started, you know, when that really started to pick up. Everybody was suddenly over six foot. Yeah, you know? it's, uh, with, with bodybuilding and powerlifting and weightlifting, you know, when television came out in the movie theaters, when Rees doing the Hercules movies and right. then coming into the 60s, all the sword and sandal movies, by the 1960s, there were so many more young kids. It used to be years and decades back, yeah, he got into bodybuilding because somebody, he was a skinny little guy, got his sand kicked in his face, or he was sick and bad, he, and he wanted to build his body back up. So that was the typical story into the barbells, but by the 60s, now you just had some guys who weren't sick. Nobody was kicking sand in their face in the first place. They were just good genetic guys coming in, so the pool was building and building, and then you're throwing the influx of steroids on top of these genetically gifted guys, and you're getting some real differentiation amongst these athletes taking place through the 70s and the 80s. And Kazmaier, he won the 1980, 81, 82, and I understand they stopped him. They would... They wouldn't let him compete for four more. He probably would have won three or four more. Absolutely, unquestionably. He, he would have just, continued winning probably until uh, the heyday of uh, John Paul. John Paul Sigmund. Yeah, like he got injured. Kazmaier started to get injured too. So, but when he came back in the late 80s, he wasn't winning it like he was. I think he had injuries. But I remember watching him when he did that log lift. Even though at the time it's been, he took 370-pound log and just he put it over his head like nothing. I understand how they're lifting 480-pound yeah, log lifts now. It's like, pounds. Unbelievable. So the the world's strongest man. Uh, I also heard too that they've kind of changed some of the the, the events to there's a, uh, there's always a lot of injuries and you're gonna get it because these guys are just doing crazy stuff, strength stuff. But that they've tried to move it towards a little bit of athleticism. So you again, you follow it now more closely well, than I do. Well, actually a very interesting uh, paradigm at work. Uh, both in the amateur and in the pro level, but at the pro level, which is probably what most of the listeners would be familiar with, the world's strongest man is, as you said, considerably more mobile. I wouldn't go so brash as to say athletic, but athletic for six foot five, three hundred fifty pound men. It's yeah. a lot more mobile. It's a lot more uh, oxygen dependent. It, it's a, fit, a bit more fitness oriented. And then the many would argue the more prestigious. Arnold Classic Series takes place on a stage. Therefore, there's no room for these mobility events. So the weights are radically escalated. Yeah. So the truly strongest people on earth are winning the Arnold Classic, and the strongest fit people are winning the world's strongest man. And it's becoming a bit of a bone of contention. You know, <laughs> the Arnold Classic winner can legitimately say, I'm stronger than the world's strongest man. Yeah, that seems to be where we are today. And again, you now these guys, they're so massive. So I know some of the guys, uh, I can't see them anymore. Being a blind guy, I haven't been able to see the competitors in many years. So it's hard for me to visualize. But I hear some of the, the competitors still, you got some of the, like you said, Reinhardt was just a massive big guy. But some of the, uh, <clears throat> pre, the winners in the last years have been fairly muscular, but just thick. Really yeah. thick, like a like a rip power lifter, a huge rip power lifter, right? So yeah, absolutely. How, I mean, I, I'm five foot four, two hundred and thirty pounds, and I have a picture of me standing next to Zadrunas Avicus, and I literally look like a child. I, I, I really? look, I, I look like his ten year old child in that picture. Gee, see, I can't I, see I come that. Up <laughs> to his sternum in, in altitude. Yeah. I come up to his sternum. And I yeah. take up about the same cross-sectional era, area as his left arm. <laughs> that gives me a visual to work with. Yeah, but these guys, uh, it just it, they're just phenomenally huge and strong. Like, I mean, and amongst the strongest guys that we can say lived in the modern era because we don't know, there's still, you can't, it's hard to compare guys like a giant McCaskill. You hear of uh, Angus McCaskill? Yeah. He lived back in 1860s. This guy is seven foot nine, four twenty five, four fifty, mesomorphic. His foot, his hand was a foot long. Like he, they said his strength was just off the map, exponential. Again, but we have no official records of it. But what right. he could, <clears throat> the strength of that man, who who knows and stuff like that. But I, I these guys, I was always a very very big fan and very enamored and and just kind of mesmerized by Vasily Alexia. I would have loved to see what he was actually capable of outside of the strict confines of Olympic lifting. Oh, I think he would have beat Wilhelm in 77, 78. Uh, Alexiev could, he didn't, he, he looked like shit. That's the problem. He had that huge <laughs> gut on him. 
But he he could he could he could sprint. He could run extraordinarily fast, right? Yeah, he had a very high vertical jump. He was a, a phenomenal athlete. Yes. Not and he, I would have bet him to beat uh, win the, you know a number of those world strongest man contests at the beginning because just uh, he was the only he was uh, well he could Wilhelm couldn't touch him in Olympic. Ken Patera, he, Ken Patera was right. Ken Patera took five fifty off the rocks and push pressed over his head. Well, Ken Patera was the first American to put five hundred pounds over his head and the second yeah, he man, followed the left, yeah. second or third I might be wrong. There was a oh what was the uh, Serge Redding might have done it. Vasily Alexia clearly did it first. In 1970, he did it in that first right. uh, that first where Arnold Schwarzenegger was televised and on right. the first time. Right, and then I can't remember if Serge Redding or Ken Patera was next. But I heard Patera. I, yeah, I had heard Patera. The, Serge the, Redding is a name that nobody talks about. He was no. truly one of the strongest human beings to ever live, ever. Yeah, I don't know much about him or what the lifts he did. Like I, I know, like um, uh, in he, he was uh, very troubled. He had a, a real, real bad emotional problems. I believe he. Actually committed suicide. I believe. I believe he took his own life. But he was truly in his in his heyday, uh, on par with Alexia Patera, all those guys. He was that amazing. Yeah, it was uh, the the after seventy two and with powerlifting, the the, the press kind of yielded now to the bench press. Correct. Um, like Chuck Sites was a bodybuilder. He could bench supposedly bench press five hundred seventy pounds. Yeah, he also uh, supposedly insisted he never took. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I know we get that, that's we get a lot of that in the industry. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I'm, I, I was I didn't take drugs until after I won this. Right. <laughs> yeah, after I won the Miss America, then I decided to take drugs. But that's that's okay. Anyway, we get a lot of that. But what bothered me with powerlifting, which I think is one of the most pure demonstrations of strength, force, contraction, force, was the um, I think they ruined it with the gear. It's like okay, a Kazmaier could do six sixty bench, you know. I, I, I in a t shirt with no belt. Exactly. Jeff Everson did a five seventy in a singlet. He didn't even have a t didn't have the elasticity of a t shirt on. He had a singlet on and two seconds at the chest. That's just pure raw strength. And they put these these shirts that that add like thirty percent. Like some of these guys are over the thousand pound mark. It's like they have no business under that weight. That shirt gives way. They're in, like what you happened know, with right kick there. Gene, this is Gene. something I point out all the time, and and I I've kind of made peace with geared powerlifting. I personally have no interest in it. I would never do it. Uh, I, I you know it's it's not for me. But I've kind of made peace with it, almost in the way that an actual athlete makes peace with pro wrestling. You watch it and you go, "That's fucking stupid." <laughs> Boy, that's kind of amazing. That's the way I feel about geared powerlifting. It's fucking stupid, and yeah. I personally would never expose myself to it. But if you're going to yeah. do it, I'll watch. Yeah, that's the way that's I feel the, about it. That's a good analogy with pro wrestling because you think, yeah, it's fixed. But the fact when a guy get like Kurt Angle who comes from the Olympics and walk stands up on a, the top of the cage, looks out at the audience, and does a, a gain a backwards flip and lands. Oh my God! I thought he was, was going to break his neck and land flat on a stump. You, you got to say. Holy shit! I would never do that in my life. And, you know, yeah. like some of the things he did. Now Brock Lesnar, who's in uh, in he's going to fight in the uh, UFC 200 again. Uh, so the yeah, McMahon he, likes that. He likes yeah. that that we can say, hey, we got one of our guys going over there to compete there. It looks good for the pro wrestlers because a lot of those sure. pro wrestlers, when you learn about shoot fighting and wrestling, some of those old guy old timers, they really knew how to uh, fight. But what I was going to say on the powerlifting front is there's a very very uh, blatant exposure that no one points out. Um, we've got two men, um, and for some reason my brain is not working and I can't recall either of their names. Scott Mendelson and um, the other big guy from Oregon, uh, whose name will come to me in a moment. Anyway, they have both benched a little over a thousand pounds in their fancy bench shirts. Yeah. And then after that, they both proceeded to attempt to break the raw bench record. And both of them struggled to do 700 raw. Meaning, a flat 700? A flat yes, 700? Yeah, did they, they get I it? I think Mendelssohn did like 712 or something. Seven, But nonetheless, it was literally 300 pounds less. That's my point. It's 30%. It's and, and like it's unbelievable. That means, that means literally the bench shirt was responsible for 30% yeah. of the lift performed. That's ludicrous. <laughs> if it was 5% or even 10%, I'd still think it's dumb, 
but I wouldn't say ludicrous. Yeah. You know, you have, I know people, I go to local bench press contests all the time, and I see guys, you know, getting credit for a 500-pound bench press, and I know damn well they'd struggle with 315. It's, it's foolish. Yeah, because a 300, I tell guys who train, a lot of my guys who come and train, they don't take steroids or anything. And I say, you know what? A 300 pound plus bench, with, if you, if you don't take drugs or anything, or you do, use anything but t-shirt, that's a, you're a strong guy. You're that's a strong a guy. Goal. Yeah, because that's a good, if you can do 400, you're really doing well. Like I, uh, in volume two, I used Jeff Everson because Everson was an interesting guy. He, uh, he was 10 years strength coach from 73 to 83. In 83, he was ranked number three in the, in the United States. First five years, he was drug free. And he said he, he, he was big guy, you know, six foot three and he was 240, 260 pounds. His bench ranged from 420 to 440. Took him years to get up there. Years yeah. to get up to 440. But he saw, he saw guys coming in who couldn't touch him, taking, started to take steroids and go past him. So Absolutely. his other five years, he, he took, and not huge doses either. They weren't big doses. And just taking it because it's not like bodybuilding where you have to take a whole pile of different drugs to get this whole different certain look. He right. just didn't want his strength to go up. And he, he went from 440 to 570. And, and just a, it, I think he said it took him four years to go from 300 to the, over the 400. And it took him only like months to go from uh, the 440 up to the 550. And then eventually he did a 5. He was going to go for a 600 pound bench, but he tore yeah, he had so torn cool. his pec. So when you take steroids and the, and the bench shirts, they really add to what would be. Uh, 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 compared to not, do they have? I don't even know if they do. They have re- any good drug testing anymore for the powerlifting uh, drug free? Um, <laughs> wow, <laughs> you're asking a really, really hurtful question. The IPF and a couple other organizations do have drug testing protocol. Some of it's even WADA approved. Now, how effective is it? If you yeah. ask them, they'll tell you some ridiculous number: eighty, ninety percent effective. If you ask me. The guy who gets paid to coach people to beat drug tests, I'd yeah. say it's approximately zero fucking percent effective. Yeah, it's like bodybuilding. There's no, there's no drug tests at all. I, I, I competed in a number of drug <coughs> events, and I took bunches of drugs, and I never failed anything. Um, yeah. I, the, the simple, I, I'm, I'm rather famous for very simple uh, quotes, and my my famed, or at least I think it's famed, quote is, "How, how do you pass a test?" You study. That's <laughs> how you pass yeah. with that. You know, yeah. If you know what they're doing, then you just don't do that and you pass. It's simple. Yeah, it's uh, like I mean, we can't. There's no getting away for the like drugs. If, drugs are probably going to be passed. Hey, we're getting into genetics now too, like manipulations Correct. and stuff like that. We're just, there's no there's no going back. Like I mean, well, I think <clears> I, this is a very much a separate subject and a separate thing. Uh, but I, I think the um, I don't want to say decriminalization because I don't really think it was ever criminal, but the change in attitude in response in relation to rescheduling, say rescheduling. Well, the, no, the, the the readjustment of the American attitude toward marijuana, I really believe, is going to be the unraveling of all of this nonsense. Yeah, I, it, I, it's I, the... I, I, I'm sincere <laughs> when I say that. I really believe that you're going to see the concern about sports drugs. Basically dissolve over the next decade. I've, I've really predicted that. I've been vocal about it, and I really think it's going to happen. The more that the um, <clears throat> we, I won't get down this lane too far. The more the world goes into cashless, we, we, we're trying to more. They're trying very very hard to get rid of cash. You're going to see these black markets dry up then because they work in cash. Then you're going to see, probably see a lot of these laws change. And if I, you want, I agree if, with that, but I, I really think it's just more of an emotional paradigm. I think that. Yeah, we have the right. Libertarian attitude is like, who has the right to tell who what they can and can't you know, take? Especially this gets into health, right? I don't even think it's that. I really think that it's there's literally multiple generations now of people that were basically, not basically, in blatantly lied to. Oh, marijuana is going to do. It's going to ruin your life. It's going to. You're going to be homeless. You're going to live on the street. It's going to be horrible. You're going to have cancer. You're going to have no memory. You're going to whatever. And now those people are 50, 60, 70 years old. They have money in their pockets. They have pensions. And they're like, you know what? That fucking government lied to me so bad. That's a shame. And they're going to begin to carry that attitude over. Well, if they were wrong about my thing, they're probably wrong about that thing. They lie to us about everything. I really believe that the general credibility of the establishment is such that people don't just don't, they don't fucking care. They don't care. I really believe that that is the era we have entered. And I don't I know agree. if it's good. I don't want to, I don't want to sound like it's, I don't want to sound like an anarchist. It's a point I of say, fact. It's a statement of fact. That's exactly. what's going on. I believe it's yeah. an admission of fact. 
And I agree with you. It's not trying to promote anarchism here. It's a point that our government just bullshits and lies to us about everything, and it, about anything and everything, including our health and sports, <clears throat> all things. So, I mean, how can we trust them? Why are they, you know, people are going to prison because of these laws and stuff, yeah. like guys just doing marijuana something or steroids. I to, something I want a completely separate subject, but something I wanted to interject, and I just, I lost it way back. When you talked about Hoffman getting older and kind of losing his control, there's another yeah. interesting point. I had a good friend who worked at York Barbell in the 80s, and he told me that an awful lot of uh, Hoffman and I.E. York losing their power over organized sports was because their revenue radically tanked because of Japanese steel. The change in the steel market radically changed what York could produce and retail their products for. Oh, that's gonna, that would, the industrial, Hoffman and York, Barbell, they're all were going to be victims of the deindustrialization and, of North exactly. America. Exactly, and, and so what happened is they were making less and less money, plus being forced to spend more and more money to keep control. And that was a major part of their decline, not so much bad decisions, but just generally being in a bad industry. <laughs> it was the it was part of the atmosphere. It was the atmosphere of a, a changing world in terms of politics and re redistribution of industry. And it was the it was the decade of the AAU being divested of their power. It was a many things with what Sprague was doing and, and you know pulling off behind the scenes to move it. Many things took place that moved power away from Hall. It was time. He was old. He had. He, he ruled for 40 years. The Weeders yeah. also ruled until they basically passed away. Mannion, the Weeders took it from Hoffman. They took it, it was a power struggle, and they took it from Hoffman, literally wrenched, wrestled it away from him, where Mannion and the boys today, they basically inherited it. Yes. <clears throat> and they didn't have to do that, and they're about to they're about to get dumped on their ass, I think, if this lawsuit It'll goes through. It would be very interesting to see where things go after the Mannion's I'll be so bold as to say go to jail, but even if they don't go to jail, yeah. they're certainly going to be slapped very, very hard. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm very curious to see what the 21st century iteration of bodybuilding and many of these other organizations are going to look like. I have no idea. It'll always be everybody's all oh, bodybuilding dying. And I said, no, nothing ever dies. It just goes less, gets less popular, and it can resurface at any time. But nothing ever really dies out. There's always going to be little niche markets for everything. Like to the pro bodybuilding today, how do you And I laugh. Was it three years ago they said the NBC was going to film the yeah. Mr. Olympia? And I said, fat chance. They're, they're, they might go there and have a look, but there's no way they're going to air. And they didn't air it. I mean, they're going to look at those and, guys. And again, I think, and this is a little off topic, but yet it isn't. Because you're a historian and you've written some extraordinary books on the history of all this. And I think that kind of the, uh, the, 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 the unwritten chapters for the future are going to mention that the media paradigm has changed in the 21st century, i.e. the Internet and Facebook and all these things. And what popularity is, per se, is going to be redefined. I think instead of the Mr. Olympia running on NBC or ESPN or whatever, or like the world's strongest man, perfect example, instead of it running on Fox Sports, <coughs> I think one day the popularity of those things is going to be reported in terms of hits on their website or views on their YouTube channel or the streaming of their live events. I think that the actual definition of things is going to shift so much that this old attitude isn't going to work. No, you're right again. The social media is re redoing everything. Even mainstream media... Uh, when you say media now, you say mainstream. People like ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Fox, they're losing their audience. They're, and their credibility ratings drop down below like 10%. People are getting bigger audiences on, on social media with, with Facebook, Twit, Twitter, Twit, and YouTube. And again, it's, 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 uh, listener or viewer beware. You have to sift through. We know with the mainstream media, it is absolutely control. I did a podcast a couple weeks ago where I said, in my opinion, C CNN is basically a left-wing advocacy attack group. Fox is basically a right-wing advocacy attack group. They have their agendas to make sure the ideologies are representative. But, Absolutely. you know, where is this happy middle ground where, okay, let's just see what the facts are instead of who you're going to vote for. Uh, you know, it, it, out on the social media, you will get those people who are trying to be honest reporting 
And it's a matter of finding. It's up to the individual to find those those outlets on the on social media who they think are giving honest uh, reporting. And you're going to see this even in the sports media too, right? They, it's, it's interesting. The, Say that, and this is a, a sociologic commentary for a, a much later date. But I don't even believe in honesty per se. I believe in perspective. Everyone is speaking from a perspective. Uh, honesty to me is kind of an unspoken. If you're going to open your mouth, I'm going to assume you're being honest. What I'm really interested in is what is your perspective? Where are you standing, and what are you seeing? Yeah, yeah, what I'm constitutes not. that perspective? Yeah, because yeah, exactly. he might think he's being exactly. honest, but even though you might think his ideology is full of shit, right? Exactly. Exactly. I, I've met many people that honestly spout shit that I walk away from gritting my teeth, just like, well, I gotta fucking get away from this guy. But exactly. I don't think they're lying to me, I just think yeah. they're wrong. There's a Delusion, yeah. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. Um, wow, I am really, and there's so much more we could talk about from there. We could, you know, getting into the, the first thousand pound squats and, uh, well, hell, that makes me think you mentioned gear, you know, powers and gear. Um, I personally believe that the, the true death toll of powerlifting was something called the monolift. I'm not even sure if you're aware of what that is. Is, is that where they pull the pens out from underneath you and stuff like that? You don't have to yeah, take the, it off. You no longer have back. to back up carrying the squat. Yeah. You can just stand yeah. in place. Yeah. The weight is you know just very gently placed on your back. You don't have to unrack, set up, and um, I, I, find, I really believe that was the end of powerlifting. As a, as a true competitive discipline. When did that come in? <sighs> Either the late 80s or early 90s. Um, it was a very elitist group when it first started. It was kind of tightly, you know, only my events have this device. And now it's ubiquitous. But I, I, I believe you're going to find that something like 92 was the first monoliths being used in competitive sport in competitive powerlifting. Yeah, again, it's, uh, it's further uh, point on to our whole t discussion today, the differentiation and specialization and all the different disciplines where uh, I, in doing Muscle Smoke and Mirrors, I enjoyed seeing all the crossovers and hybrids of the athletes through the through the past hundred years or so, where they did they did as many of those lifts as they could, and many of them today you know, will do a lot of the lifts, but they just don't compete in them. It's one thing to be a, in the gym training, and you can be serious as anybody in the gym, but it's another thing, as you will know, as a competitor, to take the next step and to be a competitor in either bodybuilding, powerlifting, weightlifting, or strongman. It's a different commitment altogether and specialization if you're going to compete. It's also the the, the thing I really coach people to understand is it, it's really an exposure. You're exposing yourself. Uh, pe people seem to forget that. They they go into these things, I don't know, it's just, an, it's just the, the younger culture is just different. They, they really fail to realize that, you know, when you're up there on that platform with a bar on your back, it's you. You are exposed to the world. What you can and can't do is going to be blatantly obvious. Yeah. Um, it's a very intimate exposure of your prowess or lack thereof. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and people forget that, and, and they oftentimes are slapped very violently by that reality. Yeah, it's um, it's a different it's a different world now, and as, like you said, it'll be interesting to see how it carries through with the, the ensuing decades that are coming up. Where we go and I would here. love to have you back to talk about the ensuing decades. Um, I'm well, assuming you... that we're going to get more of you know volume three B and C. Or two and three. I don't know how, how you how you're going to nomenclate them. Yeah, book one too. But like I, I mentioned to you, you're one of the only guys having me on these days. I seem to become a hot potato since I'm coming more closer into the uh, contemporary times. There <clears throat> seems to be a lot of people don't want to hear the truth, and that's what it seems. Like. It's just when I did the first book, everybody was interested. I I could did so many different shows, but other than Carl Lenore, Super Radio, Super Superhuman Radio, you're the only other guys asked me on his show. Well, I, I can't know. imagine anyone. <clears throat> Any interest in, in organized, you know, physical culture, which is really the word, uh, I can't imagine somebody not wanting to have you on because you're just a staggering wealth of knowledge and perspective on all this. And uh, I, I feel really gratified that you came on and talked talk to us and talked to me. And, uh, I, you, you know, the only, the only caveat I'll give to the people that are a little concerned to have you on is, and, and I'm going to say this and you don't have to, is that if you're not aware – Listeners, dear listeners, there's real live litigation taking place that um, almost certainly is going to shape the future of 
at least bodybuilding, and kind of bodybuilding is the guiding force around powerlifting, strongman, and all the other muscle sports, you're probably going to see people go to jail, lose their positions, lose their standings, lose their fortunes, um, probably a lot of placings and um, clout are going to be readjusted, at least in the in the public's eye, if not in, in, in the annals of history. So... I can understand maybe some people being a little concerned to, to have you uh, exposing their culpability, duplicity, any of the yeah, other well, words you want to put in there. It's going to be an interesting uh, 2016, uh, it 2017. Really is. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. And, and on that point, again, I just I'm really glad there's somebody like you penning it down because you know 30 years from now, I certainly hope that the generation then is reading what you're writing now. Yeah, that's one of the only reasons I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to do this current book that I'm working on. It, it's, it's, I've reconstructed how I'm going to do Volume 3. I'm definitely doing this next one, which is the from the 80s on, the story with Wayne DeMille. It's the women's bodybuilding and lifting, because I think it should be in there. <laughs> and and it's the, uh, it is the story behind the scenes with the Wayne DeMille and the Weeders. And I'm going to carry it right through to why Wayne packed it in there and carry it right onto this lawsuit with Lee Thompson and NSL against the NPC. Because it's a good ending point to the bodybuilding story wherever it goes. So I'm just kind of hanging out to see where this lawsuit goes. And then I will uh, do that book and see <clears throat> if the market opens up again to me, I might do the final one. If not, I'll just go. I have tons of different things I can do, right? right about well, it, so. this conversation makes me desperately want your take on the crossover sports. I want, I want to hear Randy Roach's anthology of powerlifting powerlifting no i wouldn't i would not go back and do a whole history of powerlifting is that what you mean well the, the powerlifting and, and it's you know olympic lifting to powerlifting even to, to strongman um you know you did such a magic job with bodybuilding i could easily see you doing the parallel i uh, i can't <laughs> because there's no market for it buddy really the amount you know, of time and money yeah. it takes to write and research to try to get it as honestly as you can, objectively yeah, as you can, people yeah, and you, to get the people to talk with you, and some of them are rake you over the coals, and some of them will talk, some won't. And it's like, man, it's stressful. I've been working on this one since 2002, and I'm really at the end of my line here. There's other things I like to write about and, and do. I, you know, I'm 57 years old. I, I. I kind of consider, consider myself semi-retired, and I like it. You know, I'm not pressured to do anything I don't, if I don't want to do it. But it, there are good topics. Like I, I mean, that's why I'm talking to you today. I love body, I love powerlifting. I love weightlifting, even though I never had the genetics to compete in them. But you, that doesn't mean you can't appreciate the the art of those uh, crafts, right? And and that's follow true. them. All you my know, friends you, like are powerlifters. You and, say that because this is something I point out to people all the time. Bodybuilding is really one of those sports. It's like NASCAR. There's very few people that actually compete in NASCAR, but yet there's millions of fans. Yeah. Bodybuilding is yeah. actually the same thing. 99.8% of all bodybuilding fans have never nor will ever step on a stage. No. They're just no, fans. I mean, most people who even don't even like to wear bodybuilding don't realize if they're in the gym changing their physique in any way, shape, or form, they are in a sense bodybuilders. They're building their body. And yeah. how, if it comes out to show that you're a power lifter, then you're a power lifter. But, you know, you're still a bodybuilder, too, because you build your body. Power lifters can't help the side effect is muscle. Exactly. Right? So, and, and that's something that I really point out to people over and over is that if it involves a barbell or an exercise machine, we're all in this together. You're a bodybuilder. Yeah, and if you happen to be really strong, you're a powerlifter. It it, it it really is. Yeah, and if you got I, the right to know because I really poo poo on yeah. that sort of thing. But there is a unity that that is very unspoken. Yeah, I found when the, all the guys I interviewed, the, the, the hardcore guys, the guys who were in it since they knew that you wanted to do it when you're eight years old, nine years right. old. They didn't know why it wasn't anything. They just liked the whole thing. I find they all have competed if they could uh, in powerlifting, weightlifting, bodybuilding. They're all into a certain level of martial arts or wrestling. They have that back. They they like it all. They like it all. And look at the wrestlers today, even the pro wrestlers. You know, they always like to carry that physique. And a lot of the UFC guys, they're not bodybuilder type guys, but they're they're hard. A lot of them are hard muscular guy, even though that has nothing to do with whether you're a good fighter or not. But they just seem to have that look where their people are watching. So you just they all have that common denominator. They just like the the physicality Absolutely. and that muscles the common denominator, right? And, and there's a 
an emotional component. There's a, a, a yeah. challenge and a, uh, and even to some degree, and I, I, I shudder to point this out because I'm probably exposing my own flawed psyche, but there's, there's also somewhat of a self-punishment, self-loathing component. I, I, you literally have met people that do it almost as penance. As penance. Yeah, they, 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 they <laughs> you know, the, 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 they appreciate the cost, as it were. Um, the, the the fact that it's difficult and and damaging and all of those things is important to some people. The challenge of it. Well, not so much the challenge, but the the fact that it makes you tired and sore and potentially not injured, but the the, the fact that it leaves a consequence. I've met a lot. Kind of like uh, I guess it'd be kind of along the lines of the psyche of a skydiver. <laughs> that you shoot don't agree? open. Yeah, if there if there isn't risk of death, there's really no yeah. risk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting, but that's uh, the the emotional side of athletics is a, a a topic that most people really don't want to hear about. <laughs> Give me a funny thought: has has any of our lifters, bodybuilding, power lifters, anybody any any of us made the Darwin Awards yet? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know, but there's many. Uh, I could offer you many a candidate. <laughs> yeah, the YouTube's coughing up a lot. I wish I could see. I've heard there's a lot of crazy things being put up on YouTube. Other things happening in the gym. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. The- Women doing stuff. snatches and high heels, and yeah, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's some funny yeah. stuff out there for sure. Yeah. Anyways, I think uh, the, the main point of today was the the the, the relationship of the disciplines through the past 25 years, and I think we absolutely covered quite a bit of stuff. We we have, and again, I can't thank you enough. And you're welcome to come back anytime. Talk about anything you like, uh, ranging from you know volume two, you know book three, volume two. Uh, to just, you know, generally, you can even come back and update us on the disposition of the, the evolving lawsuit. Anything you like. Anything you yeah, like. Yeah, no problem with that, Robert. I really appreciate have, it. You have an open window to come and speak. I will do my best to get it in front of as many people as possible. Uh, one, because that suits me, and two, because people need to hear this stuff. They need to know about you. They need to buy your books. And that's not cheesy marketing. That's reality. Books are powerful. I am a huge fan of, of, of tangible books. Um, they're, they're essentially eternal. They're powerful. And this is knowledge that people need. I really can't emphasize that enough. All right. So, M- Mr. Roach, I want to thank you for writing the things, the fabulous things you have. I want to thank you for being here. And uh, I just generally want to thank you, sir. Awesome. It was a fun show. Appreciate it. I, I agree. Thank you. We'll speak again soon.